Well, hello, friends. I hope you're having a great day today. Welcome to Thursday's edition of Take 5. The message that I preached this past Sunday is what we've been breaking down all week. <clears throat> we titled that thing, The Cradle, The Cross, and The Crown. That's actually a title that Billy Graham put on a book that he wrote many years back, but the message is still the same uh, still to this day, the importance of understanding that all of that is what makes the Christmas season relevant to you and me today. It's the conglomerate of those three. It's not just the fact that Jesus was born during this season. We, we seem to recognize and celebrate that the most, but, but that's not what makes Christmas everything that it is. Uh, the coming of our Savior uh, so that he might redeem mankind from our sin took everything that's involved from the cradle to the cross and to the time that he was crowned with glory and honor and given a name that's above every name. All of that is what was necessary so we could be delivered from sin. And we're just kind of talking about all of that all the way through. Now, yesterday we left off talking about that he became Emmanuel, God with us. And we looked at what it was what was necessary for that to happen. Now, when the, while the birth of uh, uh, most children would normally be a cause for great rejoicing, the birth of Jesus, that, that joy would not last very long because, you see, this child was born to be persecuted, to suffer, and to die. Uh, we know that for a fact from the very uh, idea of what Herod was doing during the time not long after his birth, having all of those babies killed, trying to eliminate the seed, eliminate the child that would become the man that would die for the sins of the world, uh, fulfilling that prophecy that God gave some 4,000 years back. That's exactly what Herod was trying to do was to stop that. Now, when Jesus was less than a month old, his parents carried him to the temple in Jerusalem to be consecrated to the Lord. And there they met an old godly man by the name of Simeon, who said to Mary and Joseph, this child is going to cause many people in Israel to fall and rise. God has sent him, but many will speak against him. The thoughts of many hearts will be known and a sword will wound your own soul too. This innocent, beautiful little baby is going to grow into a man that's going to have to die for the sins of the world. And this purpose would be the sword that would wound and pierce his mother's heart and hurt her so dearly, knowing the fact that her son that she loves with all of her heart is going to have to suffer and die for the sins of the world. Now, Paul gave us some, some great insight in Philippians and teaches us how that Jesus maintains the status of 100% God and 100% man because it took both of that to save us from our sin. He had to be 100% God. He had to be 100% man. It was both necessary. And Paul teaches us very vividly how this happens. Philippians 2, he says, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ, who being in the form of God did not consider it to be a robbery to be equal with God, but made of himself no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in likeness of man. And being found in appearance as man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Basically, this passage is telling us that the fight, despite the fact that Jesus had become fully human, that he felt in no way that this was an insult to the Godhead or to the part he played in the Godhead. He voluntarily laid aside his expression of deity, but he never laid aside his possession of deity. You need to understand that. You need to make sure you grasp that. He voluntarily laid aside his expression. He chose not to express himself as divine, but he never let go of the possession of being divine. He was always God. He was always equal with God, but he chose to express himself as a man so that he could save us from our sin. Philippians says this in a couple of other translations. He was like God in every way, but he did not think that his being equal with God was something to use for his own benefit. 
So he chose not to express himself as divine for his own benefit, even though he could have done that on many occasions that would have worked things in his favor. For instance, when he was, <coughs> excuse me, when he was praying in the garden of Gethsemane and he said, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass for me. He he could have he could have called the you know the sun card, played the sun card right there, and said, "Hey, I really don't want to do this," and it would have been over, done deal, and mankind would have been lost forever. But he he chose not to express himself through divinity there, even though he was still God. Another time when they came to arrest him, and Peter pulled his sword, and he's cutting off ears and trying to split wigs and everything, and Jesus says, "Hey, son." Put that thing up. Don't do this. Don't you know that I could call more than 12 legions of angels if I wanted to and be delivered from this? So, so Jesus lets him know, look, I could do this because I, I still possess my divinity, but I choose not to express it right now so that I can save mankind. The verse 7 and 8 of Philippians 2 says, instead he emptied himself of his outward glory by reducing himself to the form of a lowly servant, and he became human. He humbled himself and became vulnerable, choosing to be revealed as a man. Did you hear that? Choosing to be revealed as a man and was obedient. He was a perfect example, even in his death, a criminal's death by crucifixion. I love it that he said, uh, that, that Paul says he humbled himself. And, and he had to do it because no one could humiliate Christ because he was still equal with God. So he had to humble himself so that he could do that. He, he wasn't humbled when they arrested him. He wasn't humbled when they dressed him in a scarlet robe and put a flimsy reed in his hand. He was not humbled when they blackened his eyes and bruised his rib. He wasn't humiliated when they tied him to the whipping post and gave him 39 lashes. He wasn't humbled when the spit of the Roman soldiers ran down his face where they had pulled great chunks of his beard out, or even when they stripped him naked and hung him on the cross, stretched him wide and hung him high between heaven and earth. He still was not humbled by any of those things. His humiliation came, his humbling came when he hung there possessing the power to stop all of this, yet choosing to express himself as a man so that he could deliver us from our sin. He became a man to die for mankind. And I'm so thankful that he was willing to go through all of this. So you see, friend, we celebrate Christmas. It's not just about a baby that came. It's about a baby that came, that was born, that lived, and that chose to suffer as a man so that he could die in our place. Tomorrow, we're going to talk about that crown uh, of glory and honor that he has received. And, and I think it's going to be something that's going to be enlightening because the next time we see him, that is how we will see him. We'll see him crowned with glory and honor. Hey, it could be today. It could be tomorrow. And if it is, will you be ready? If not, make preparations. You don't want to miss that for the world. Hey, I've got to get out of here. Look forward to being with you tomorrow on Friday's edition of Take 5. Till then, God bless you. Have a great day. Remember, friend, trust the Lord. He will never fail you.